Okay, um, so this is the uh, third lecture, and we're going to talk about uh, numerical analysis. And uh, th the first thing I'm going to do is just actually uh, just uh, a slight uh, numerical experiment to calibrate uh, the potential to some sort of experimentally measured um, moduli. And what we'll show is, is that we've, we've have this theory for, for general potentials, and so we decide eh, we'll do an implementation with a, an exponential. And what we find when we compare it with the experiment is, is oops, we need a more general uh, functions uh, of a more general type. So we're going back to the drawing board now and, and, and using more general ones. But just to show you that be careful when you want to implement this numerically. You want to have a potential that has all the features. Uh, the potentials that we've been doing so far are generic and do have all the features. But if you specialize in for computation, make sure that uh, you choose one uh, appropriately. So, so what I, I'm going to show you is a joint work with uh, Alex uh, Schweitzer and, and Patrick Deal, uh, which is a finite difference scheme. Okay, so we, we look at a finite difference scheme now, and uh, here's our neighborhood again, but now it's a finite. Uh, so we have a lattice of points, <laughs> of centers, and we have a paradynamic neighborhood here. And all the centers that fall into the paradynamic neighborhood then are the points that Xi interacts with. So this is a discrete problem. So, so basically we have here, uh, nearest in this particular picture, it's nearest neighbor interactions. It's, it's usually lots more than nearest neighbor. And in fact, uh, the theorems that I'll show you about numerical analysis will say how many you need inside this uh, in order to understand, to get a well-posed uh, finite difference scheme. But suppose this is the, the, the schematic, and so xi is the center point of the neighborhood, and it's of some, well, this is h epsilon, and this, it should be h delta. This is the radius now, is delta. And so we are looking uh, there, and, and so everybody interacts. This is the local, this is the neighborhood in which uh, these points here interact with that point, and these points out here do not interact with that one. And again, we have a, a general form of potential, which is, is some sort of profile, which is softening of beyond uh, this, and, and here it's a stiffening, and this is the xi is the base point. I'll, I'll, I'll show you again. xi is the base point here, and xj are these points there. So that's xj. And so um, then we have, the, again, the, uh, the softening part of the profile is over here. So we're going to take a specific choice of profile uh, in a second. Uh, but, but first, before I do that, what we have here is we have the uh, discretized version of the uh, evolution, which is at uh, x point, xi is the base point, uh, xi is the base point here, and then we sum over all points in the neighborhood, xj, the paradynamic force. And to that force, we add a, a volume element because it's discretized, and so now it's a, a volume element, vj. So what you have to understand is, is that quite quickly, we're actually looking at uh, L2 approximations or, or field approximations, discrete field approximations of the actual uh, deformation, not points on a lattice, okay, because of this volume element here. So this is a non-local operator, and so we're summing up interactions from nearest neighbor points, but we're also multiplying by a volume element, which is given by the Voronoi, uh, you know, Voronoi, uh, neighborhood here of that. So we multiply by these volume elements to intr introduce the non-local term. Okay, so that's what's there. And again, this is our discrete strain along the direction. Okay? And then we have our discretization. H is the discretization length. And so here's our, our formula. Here's our potential. And, and this is the general profile function that we use right here. And this is the derivative of the profile, which gives us the force. And now we're going to pick a specific choice of f. We'll make a specific choice of f and do some numerics. And so the specific choice of f, what we're going to do is we'll just take it to be an exponential, <laughs> say, uh, with, with two parameters, beta and alpha. Alpha uh, controls the decay. Beta here is a parameter that's going to be an elastic parameter. And also it's going to somehow figure into fra fracture toughness. And so our potential now will be realized by the specific model, the specific uh, nonlinear model, which is the force 
<coughs> which will give us our our strain versus um, force relation. So we'll have a, a different strains, we'll, and it'll be symmetric here. So this is strain versus force. And here we're going to use this exponential function to um, model the profile. Okay. And so we just took one that, that gives a profile. And so then we, we go ahead and we know how to calibrate uh, uh, our, our profile. But here, here for example, this, is, this should be um, W here. So this is a plot of W. And it's conca convex, concave, with a limit point. And then the derivative of, the of W, that is partial derivative with respect to S, is this... Um, is this uh, softening force here, and here's the stiff, this is the strength, this is the high, highest force you can apply before it begins to soften, and this is for different parameters, alpha and beta, but we vary the parameters. <coughs> and so we're going to vary these parameters in order and calibrate them according to measured values of fractured toughness or measured values of elastic constants. We will do, be because we have two parameters, <coughs> we'll, we will see we're going to calibrate it towards this fracture toughness. That's F infinity there, or W infinity. And this is the profile uh, F prime at zero. These will be the elastic properties. These will be the fracture toughness, like so. And so uh, what we do is, is, according to our exponential model, we find that F prime at zero is, is the product alpha times beta, these parameters. F infinity is beta. So to fit the fracture toughness then, and for a given influence function, then uh, out w w if this is measured experimentally, experimentally, then we will fit alpha and beta according to these relations here. So if this is known and this is known, then we can determine alpha and beta. Okay, so that's how we do it. Okay, so what we'll do is, is we'll pull off experimentally measured values of these and then determine our alpha beta. And so that's what's done here. Now, I have here uh, a stress, uh, stress intensity, but this is related to um, the, uh, G, the fracture toughness. These, these guys are related to each other, according to this, this rule here. Which this is the bulk modulus of the material, and the bulk modulus is given in terms of the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. So in particular, we'll know, we, we, we will be given the Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, we'll find K, we also know the fracture tough. Uh, we we know this uh, stress intensity factor, which gives us the fracture toughness, and in turn, then we can solve for alpha and beta. And these are the understood material properties. So we find alpha and beta. Okay, and 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 these guys are determined experimentally. And so we inform our model according to the experimentally determined uh, values of fracture toughness and and uh, and Young's modulus. And what we do is we perform a numerical experiment where we pull on either side, the, our body force is limited right here to these two um, <coughs> nodes on the left side and on the right side. Up here we have no force, no force so traction free if you will. And we know it's a well-posed problem, so we pull very slowly, same force everywhere through this dimension here, pull very slowly uh, at, the, at this um, right here, okay? And so our, our sample size is one by one by one meter. And the green colored nodes, like I said before, is where the body force is applied. We pull it slowly. What we're going to do here is, is we're going to measure the deformation inside the center region because of symmetry. And it's far enough away such that if we pull slowly, we won't see waves coming in from the boundary. We'll just see uh, uh, a uniform uh, deformation here, which is consistent with uh, elastic properties. <coughs> we'll also see what I'd like to show first is a Poisson ratio, and so that is is in the center here. In the center here, we look at the deformation in time of this will change to an ellipsoid, and so with the deformation in y and the deformation in x. So if we have a, a constant or a time deformation in in the x, this could contract and this could expand. Okay, and the Poisson ratio measures the length change, this to that, okay? And for normal material, when we pull, we're pulling on the sides of this on our experiment, we pull, then uh, well, hopefully for our calibrated values, we will see that the lengths of the center ellipsoid contract, okay? And that will be called the Poisson effect, 
okay? And so that's the Poisson effect here in, in Y, in the vertical, and we could also have a Poisson effect if we have more dimensions through the thickness in Z, okay? And we go ahead and we apply this force here, a constant force in time of 40,000 newtons along the X direction, and we find a contraction in both the Z and X directions due to pulling on the Pulling on the X, we have a z contraction here in the uh, Y and in the Z direction, consistent with the Poisson effect. It's a uniform contraction. It verifies it, so that we're happy about that. Um, we find that, uh, that for our particular material, we're expecting a Poisson ratio of one quarter, and we see that we have a nice uh, linear increasing Poisson effect as we pull. Okay, so fine, but... We're supposed to be modeling a certain material, and here it was called PMMA. And what we should really be sealing, seeing is that somehow this, this, this line here shouldn't be linear. It should actually come up, stay along this line, and then drop. So we're not seeing what we want. But the point is, is the reason we're not seeing this was, is there is another parameter that we should be calibrating to. <coughs> In addition to getting the linear elastic properties here and uh, the, the fracture toughness, which is given by this formula here, the fracture toughness is given by this limiting asymptote here. So we calibrate for this. We calibrate for the uh, derivative here, but we do not calibrate for strength. And because we, got our, because we only have two parameters in our exponential model, so we could only calibrate for two things. And what we found was that we should be failing for PMMA. That is, is that we never calibrated this one here. I mean, this one here is, is fixed. Wherever it fails or wherever it softens is determined by, the, because we only have two parameters, is already predetermined by alpha and beta because we chose those according to the slope here and the asymptote there. That predetermines this. So we didn't have enough degrees of freedom in our, our model, okay? And I just want to let people know that so that when you, when you try a, 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 an exponential and say this is for fracture, well, you're missing another thing, which is strength, okay? So this is a fun problem. Anyway, so what, what we got was, 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 fi oops, was fine, but, but it was too strong. It was too strong. In fact, the material breaks right around here anyway, so it softens. And this model does not see that, okay? So I just wanted to give you a, a, a warning, you know? If, if we do do a, a, a realization of our potential, we have to be careful and pick one, really according to experiments. But this is because it's, this is a, a young theory, and it needs to be uh, calibrated correctly, and there's going to be a lot of hiccups, and, but the fun part is, is we, can, we can work through those hiccups and uh, uh, do better. But anyway, this was an example. So this is a numerical experiment, and we see from the numerical experiment we didn't capture the strength properly because it, our, 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 our softening was not, uh, it, was, it was correlated to the stiffness and the fracture toughness, and we need that to be independent. Of course, we can take a profile which the softening is independent of this, and, and, and this asymptotic limit, but we didn't do it. So we go back to the drawing board and, and pick one, okay? So anyway, I, I wanted to show you this because this is the interplay of, of a numerical experiment and experimental experiments. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's what is basically said here. And the, ba the basic thing is, is we didn't, this is already predetermined and is incorrect. Since we've already determined alpha and beta, we can find our bar. It's some function of alpha and beta but it's, it's, it's not independent of those two parameters, so this model gets the strength wrong. But we can do better, and we can, we can do better. Uh, what we have to do is just cho choose our profile function differently. Okay, <coughs> now what I want to do is, is enough of the experiment, or the experiment, and this was done with, uh, this was done with Alex and, uh, uh, and uh <coughs> Patrick here at, uh, here at the Institute. Um, what I wanted to, just give you a rundown of non numerical analysis for non-local models and what's out there. And this is by no means a complete um, approach, 
or complete treatment, but for, for non-local P, P. Laplacian, uh, Marta Dea and Max Gunsberger uh, have, have, have done some, uh, some of the seminal work on this, um, on, on, on understanding uh, how to discretize the fra fractional Laplacian and convergence. And then Ricardo Nocetto and, uh, uh, and these, these, these authors here have gone and, and used some ideas of Louis Caffarelli and, and, and uh, they've gone ahead and discretized uh, the non-local P. Laplacian, okay? Um, <coughs> for non-local diffusion, not necessarily uh, P. Laplacian type, and para paradynamics, then we have some work of, of, of these folks, uh, Chung Du, Max, <coughs> Rich, <coughs> Lu Huk, and Zhao, um <coughs> which have done some non-local diffusion problems with volume constraints on bounded sets. These are unbounded sets. Um, and then here, <coughs> for exclusively paradynamics uh, in the linear regime, <coughs> some analysis and comparison of approximations by uh <coughs> Tian and, and Chung Du. And uh, there, there will be a, a special uh, uh, seminar, uh, special uh, workshop here uh, later in April, I believe it is, on, on, these, on these topics. <coughs> <coughs> then, for some linear paradynamic models, uh, uh, interesting work of uh, uh, Barak Aksoyu and Tadeli Mangesha, uh, and uh, th they're, they're looking at the discretizations and convergence studies and convergence estimates, uh, rigorous ones. And then uh, here, um, domain decomposition techniques, Barack Soyu and Mike Parks at Sandia, uh, and then uh, Florin Barbaru. Bar Bar uh, these folks have, uh, have worked on adaptive refinement and scaling in 1D, okay? And then uh, Chen and Gunsberger uh, in uh, uh, again, continuous and discontinuous finite element methods uh, for linear, for linear models. Um, then, really, numerical experiments for nonlinear models. Uh, a very interesting uh, look at, at a bifurcation of uh, a crack branching, based on reflection of waves from the boundary on on finite domains. That the waves come back, they interact with the crack and cause it to break. And they do very careful studies of, of the interaction near near the crack itself. And okay, these are formal, but I think they're, they, they, they certainly give rise to lots of thinking and, and they're, they're very well done. Um, <coughs> then we, we have more, more work of, of Florine and then uh, uh, lots more work. And then uh, this uh, one dimensional uh, analysis uh, of Olaf Wechter and Rohan Aberitnia on uh, dynamics of bars and, and, and a study of that. Um, what we're going to talk about today, though, is the model that we introduced uh, here, okay? And we're going to talk and get a uh, convergence study uh, for that using a finite uh, different scheme, okay? Uh, so uh, what, we, what we'll first do in order to get estimates uh, for convergence, we actually have to look at a slightly regular, more regular space than L2. We'll, we'll look at Holder continuous solutions uh, of this paradynamics evolutions for Holder continuous initial data and body force. For those solutions, we'll obtain a rate of convergence of a finite difference scheme in L2 uh, and, and show that it converges in L2 to the whole to older continuous solutions over bounded times. <coughs> but what's also interesting is we'll just show that the holder continuous solutions also converge uh, to limit evolutions in SBBD2 uh, in when we vanish horizon. So it goes again to this sharp interface limit. Now one question is, is that <coughs> you have to take your initial data in a proper way to drive it to have a, a uh, jump set, okay? So the, we start off with initial data now not in SBD, but maybe even con uh, has a continuous derivative, and, and we're interested in, we don't even have a density theorem in SBD for these things, but we have what is called a Strix approximation theorem, but there's new work to be done there, and maybe it's already somewhere done uh, where you can take initial data and drive it in some sense to an SBD function and cause in the limit, a, you, you can guarantee a, 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 a sharp jump, okay, of these holder solutions for, for sufficiently uh, bad continuous uh, initial data, 
Okay, that is with gradients that are bad. Okay, so we're, lo we're going to look at holder continuous initial data, so we're saying nothing about their gradients. Okay, so, so we'll, we'll come back to that, but we're going to look at holder continuous solutions. And in fact, again, from an approximability standpoint, we'd like to have smooth, smooth uh, solutions of paradynamic equations. We don't want to have to figure out where the jumps are. We'd like to have smooth, regularized approximations for fracture. Or, if you will, you could think of this as a multi-scale approximation to fracture. And somehow the mo this mesoscale, which gives you the you can use smooth approximation, smooth functions on, is actually a coming from yet a, m a smaller scale. So anyway, we'll, we'll show that these evolutions have holder continuous solutions and that you can approximate them in L2 and we'll get convergence rates. <coughs> so, so the holder norm is, is the holder norm on D and uh, it's simply, we're going to assume that uh, we have a cont continuous part and we take the soup over our, our set and then we have our, our holder semi-norm which is given uh, by the usual where gamma is an exponent between one and zero, including one. Okay, so we can have Lipschitz continuous functions here. So this is our holder norm. Our and uh, let me see, do I, I didn't, int okay. And then we have our paradynamic equation, again, viewed this way. And as before, it's common when you have two derivatives to turn this into a first order in time equation, a system, so a first order system where we'll let our vector be the uh, deformation, displacement, and, and the other component be the velocity, where the velocity is the time derivative of the displacement. We'll ask that both of these be in holder space, and then we'll ask that, we'll turn this into a system, so uh, the, the second component of the force will be this one, okay, in terms of the displacement, and the first component will be in terms of the velocity, and then, <coughs> <coughs> we have to do boundary conditions, and the boundary conditions will simply be the ones extended outside the closure of D by zero, and we'll pose the ODE over this, this uh, Bonnock space here. Okay. <coughs> so we have the paradynamic equation is a first order system. Uh, it, uh, for, for every time, it's a C1 function of time into this uh, Bonnock space, and it's given by the ODE and the initial conditions are fixed. Okay, so this is the initial displacement, initial velocity, this is our holder Bonnock space, zero boundary conditions, and we have use existence and uniqueness of holder solutions for bounded times. Okay, so uh, provided that the right-hand side is, is uh, the, mac you know, supremum of this holder norm is, is less than infinity on this time interval, then we have a unique solution here that's continuous of the integral equation or equivalently for the differential equation for that initial datum. And these guys are Lipschitz continuous in time for T and J. And again, this follows from, uh, uh, the proof of this follows from Lipschitz continuity <coughs> of uh, F here, okay? But it's, 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 it's a little more work because it's locally Lipschitz continuous, but you can show that you can get a short time existence and then you can continue it to arbitrarily finite time intervals. So a little more work for showing existence, but you have it. So we have it. So now we'd like to approximate it. So we're going to, loosely speaking, introduce a finite difference scheme. So what I'll do is to, to fix ideas, th this will be our mesh inside our domain D. Here will be our rind, in which solutions are zero. Okay, this rind, again, is of uh, diameter 2 epsilon, or it could be just a little bit more than epsilon. And this is our mesh that we're going to do our finite differences in. And this would be a, a mesh point, xi. It'll be of size h. And this will be the um, domain, a square domain about that. So... I'll be more, uh, now I'll just say it in words, let H be the mesh size and <coughs> delta T be the size of the time step. Uh, we keep our horizon fixed, so we're only going to look at solutions at fixed epsilon. Keep our horizon fixed, uh, the neighborhood of non-local interaction fixed, and we will assume that the discretization lies below that neighborhood. We'll say how far <laughs> in a minute. Uh, now we let the um, discrete set 
be the set of uh, uh, po points belonging to the lattice in, in, in uh, such that uh, they lie inside D. Okay? And, okay. and um, time, we, we discretize in, in, in time uh, according in our discrete, discrete parameter there is delta T. So we fix delta T, we fix H, and um, we only assume here that the index set uh, for these guys here are such that points lie inside the domain. Okay. And so we don't denote our finite difference point, difference approximation at the grid point, um, K delta T X I, so K delta T X I, K time steps in, as uh, with hats, u hat k, uh, v hat k. So this is our displacement and velocity. And again, here's our typical mesh. <coughs> okay, so now what we need to do, because we have non-local, we're, we're integrating actually, we're integrating. So what we really have here, when I say discrete, is we have piecewise constant functions, step functions, okay? So let u be a, a unit cell of volume hd corresponding to the grid point. So imagine actually, We'll, we'll take instead, we'll take a Veroni cell around a grid point of, 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 of side length h, okay? And that, on that, we'll describe the uh, step function. So that's what that'll be. So this is a step function. We take discrete values here uh, and, and turn it into a step function, okay? And this is the indicator function of ui, and this is the, now it, you can view this as an L2 field uh, step function and the velocity as well as an L2 field step function. And here I introduce functions by just saying at the kth time step, u hat k, and at the kth time step, uh, v hat k, okay? So these are at the, the grid points, but then we extend them to L2 functions. Now we can understand the non-local operator acting on this, this field. <laughs> and so we start with our first finite difference scheme, <laughs> okay? And the finite difference scheme then Will be a Euler, we'll use a forward Euler time discretization, and we write the difference for the UKs. Here's the velocity, so the time derivative of u is, the, is given by v, and this is in the discrete setting. So at the k plus one time step minus u at k th time step at, at the grid point i divided by t is, is the velocity, and similarly the change in the, uh, the time derivative of the velocity, the discretized time derivative of velocity is now equal to the non-local force acting on the uh, L2 field or the piecewise constant field at Xi, okay, and then your body force. So y it is a little different than differential operators. We're already sort of uh, looking at L2 piecewise step, step functions and we're understanding, we want to understand how they approximate the actual solution. So the scheme then is complemented with the dis uh, initial uh, conditions. They're discretized as well. Okay, and here I've written them as fields in L2, okay? And um, so this will be the error. So let these guys denote um, the finite difference uh, solutions associated with a grid of coarseness h and time step delta t. And so this will be the velocity, the, the, the uh, piecewise constant functions in space and time, in velocity and time, and this is, and th so this is the displacement, this is the velocity. And we'll define the error to be um, this uniform norm in time of uh, the function, the actual solution at time t, uh, the difference between the actual solution and the discretized uh, piecewise constant field, and in the soup norm, I mean in the, in the yeah, uniform in time with respect to L2. And the same for the velocity. So this is the error of the, uh, the discrete scheme incurred uh, for the displacement, and this is the error incurred for the velocity. Okay. Well, we have a theorem. It basically says that we do have a convergence of the finite difference approximation, provided your limit solution is holder continuous, and we do assume some time regularity. So what we did was, is we worked hard to find existence of solution in the holder space. On the other hand, we have to, and this is work for the future, but for the moment, we, we, we ask that the solution be in C2 instead of C1, okay? And this is very interesting, and we, we need to patch this up, okay? But this is a theory. Assume that it is in C2, it's holder. Uh, then uh, the so size of horizon is fixed. 
then for epsilon, or for h less than epsilon, uh, we have that the difference scheme is consistent in both time and space, discretizations, and that the sum of the errors actually go to zero at speed with the time step. And here, h is the spatial discretization uh, raised to the power gamma, where gamma is the holder exponent, and that goes between zero and one inclusive. And here we see that it has to be less than the square of the horizon. Okay? So we demand that for holder continuous solutions. So uh, in, in many uh, uh, paradynamic simulations, eh, you know, they take it smaller than the horizon, and uh, okay, right? Well, but, but, but here's some, some bedrock, I guess you could say. Uh, uh, okay. And now what about the general one-step scheme where you have a blend of implicit one-step and, 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 and forward um, uh, Euler? Uh, so if we, we let our blend be between 0 and 1, uh, then, then we can write our, 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 our one general one-step, which is a blend of implicit and explicit, uh, this way, okay, as, a, as, a, as these averages. And now we have a new, a new discrete scheme. And so basically the forward Euler scheme is obtained by taking theta equal to zero. The backward Euler scheme is obtained by choosing this in, in this scheme uh, theta equals one, and Crank-Nicholson is theta equals one half, okay? So we have this other scheme, okay? Uh, complemented with initial data, okay? And again, we're going to assume every and this is just for ease of exposition, that we assume the error in initial data is zero. We don't have to, but, but it just makes for an easier statement. Uh, so uh, convergence of the finite difference approximation for general one-step schemes, again, assume this regularity in time and, and this in space. Then uh, the material domain is bounded. We assume that, and fixed horizon. Then we ask for this blend that the time step must be less than epsilon squared uh, by some constant. And uh, it's consistent, again, in both temporal and spatial discretizations. And we have a convergence of the error of this sort. Okay? <coughs> so this gives us some guidance on the time step. This gives us some, this tells us uh, what the convergence rate. Okay? All right. So we actually have some convergences. So the thing we have rigorously established is this is true for uh, schemes here. Here we've actually added a time derivative, so we have, have a convergence there. Um, <coughs> then Crank-Nicholson, uh, if we actually assume a little bit more regularity in time, then we get a better convergence, okay, for Crank-Nicholson, okay? So at least we, we see that this model, the discretization is getting close to a solution under uh, subject to these conditions. Um, but what we'd like to do um, is, is understand, let us say, the stability. Suppose you have an iterative method, you're running it on your computer, and you want to know at each time step how is the error decreasing, okay? So these, these theorems here that I showed you before didn't worry about that. They just said if you run it, you know, up to time t, you know, and, and you choose your time step and your, your um, spatial discretization accordingly, this is the error you get, okay? That's what that says. <laughs> and, and that's good, yeah, that's, that's something. Now you say, well, I'm in the field and I want to know at each time step, what's my convergence? You know, what's happening here? How uh, am I getting better and better at each time step, okay? The usual thing. And so um, now we go further. So suppose the solution is near the displacement field at some iteration, and what we'll do is, is we'll perturb away at some later times uh, this perturbation, S, and we assume that the perturbation at some later times is close to this state, okay? And so we, we ask ourselves, well, what, is, what, what about the numerical method? Is it getting, if we start here, do we get to here, okay? Do we converge to there? And does my iteration at each step get closer and closer to the actual solution at time t? Okay, so we take a perturbation and we investigate. So we want to know, does this perturbation go to zero? In which case we would be getting closer as we evolve to time t, or is this perturbation blowing up? Okay, and so 
we'll write the associated strain for, for the state we start at here, and the strain of the perturbation we write there. And now we expand the paradynamic uh, force in Taylor series about where we start and assume S is small. So we, we do this formally. And we get the D uh, Jacobian matrix here at that state, U bar. And the Jacobian matrix is very easy to compute. And we finally get it to first to leading order. We get that the, the uh, second time derivative of, of the perturbation is given by this uh, Jacobian acting on uh, on the uh, strain. Here we have the second derivative, okay, stability. We have the second derivative sitting here. And then we have our right hand side, okay, sitting there. Okay. And then we have, so just substituting Taylor series, this is what we get. And this is our, uh, this is the usual bond potential. And this is the second derivative. Um, so what we're going to do now is we'll take a special perturbation that we can somehow do analysis on. And so uh, we take a, a, a radial perturbation such that the associated uh, strain associated with this is a, a simply a temporal component multiplied by a vector. Okay? So S will have radial variation about S, X, and the actual perturbation, S, at, at the point Y will be related uh, to its value at X according to this radial perturbation. So this is a constant vector. This shows when x equals y, you're actually at delta u mu, and otherwise you're varying radially. So I'm just going to look at a, at a paradynamic neighborhood and investigate stability there and just see what occurs. So we have then, under this perturbation, we have a local ODE. This is a fixed vector, fixed vector. We have a, a stability uh, matrix multiplying this vector and this function of time, and this is the right-hand side. The stability matrix is actually self-adjoint and given by this rank one <laughs> integral of a rank one matrix here, multiplied by this prefactor, which is, uh, indicates the stability or instability of, uh, of uh, our bond potential, and B is the uh, right-hand side. So this is our, our system. And now we're uh, in interested in understanding what uh, delta does, because that will tell us what S does for this particular perturbation that we took, the radial symmetric perturbation. So we're going to investigate then uh, the stability of forward Euler and backward Euler schemes on this linear system. So this is standard stuff uh, that we do here. And so we do that. And so uh, the stability condition basically is obtained by analyzing. We forget the right-hand side, and we just analyze this ODE here. And we write this as the first-order system. And so then we, we, we have a, a, we replace the second derivative with just one derivative, but now a system. And this is the associated first order of system, where A acts on the uh, displacement here, and delta 2 is the velocity, or uh, related to the velocity. Delta 2 mu is the velocity. And so here's our, here's our second derivative, the acceleration equals the linearized, or the Jacobian here, acting on the displacement. <coughs> This is a vector in RD. So what we'll do is since A is um, self-adjoint, well, then we know what its eigenvalues and eigenvectors are. So um <coughs> we can go ahead and, and, and we know that the eigenvalues are real. We'll promote them by, by that. And the associated eigenvectors are VI. So let's choose then. We'll just diagonalize and work in the basis of I span by the, uh, you know, in the according to each eigenvector. So we'll choose this to be one of the eigenvectors. And then we have this system here for, for ODE. And then what we can do is we can apply the forward Euler method to this system. And this is gives us this, our time scaping. So uh, at time the next time step, this is how it's related to <coughs> the previous time step. And here, <coughs> the key point is, is to note that A acting on this vector is going to be, since it's a eigenvector, it's going to be lambda. So we're going to have here in the second equation, lambda times step delta 1 plus delta 2. And here, <coughs> we don't have lambda. Okay, this is the iteration in time for, for the first one. Well, we can go ahead, and, and basically this is, the, this is a, a matrix times a, a vector. Delta 1k, delta 2k is the vector. And then the matrix is the matrix 1. Well, let me write it down. 
we have some time. I don't have to go fast. <coughs> so um, we have, <coughs> let me look here and just see what it is. It's, it's uh, given by <coughs> uh, 1 uh, delta t, a lambda i, delta t, and I'll, I'll put this back up, 1. So it's basically this matrix here. And I'll write this like this. Delta K. And we'll just write here delta 1K, delta 2K. So this is our, this is our system. Okay. And this is our matrix. This is the uh, 2, 2, uh, two one entry, lambda I, delta T. And our 2, 2 entry is 1, our 1, 1 entry is 1, and our 1, 2 entry is delta T. So this is the matrix, and we're interested in the um, stability of this matrix as we multiply it by itself. That will tell us, well, let me just continue. <laughs> Most of you, al everybody probably already knows already, but as we multiply it by itself, then, then we would amplify this thing if the spectral radius of this is bigger than 1. If the spectral radius of this matrix is less than 1, then we... There's a diminution as we multiply of these, and we'll get a convergence. So a, a straight and easy calculation, we'll calculate the uh, spectral radius of that. Okay. And the spectral radius for that particular matrix uh, is bigger than 1. <laughs> okay. It's bigger than 1. Okay, so then that's for any choice. So forward Euler is is not stable uh, under these types of perturbations. So that's information, okay? So let us look now at backward Euler, and, 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 and let's see what happens there. So for backward Euler, in order for things to work, we have to have the time step less than, than the square of the uh, paradynamic horizon. And <coughs> for that case, we get the following iterative system, described by the inverse of the matrix, <coughs> okay? Okay, so it it's given by the inverse of the matrix. And so then we compute the spectral radius of that. Ah, okay, and so we have some more interesting things going on. And so the spectral radius is given by this formula. So let us suppose first that all the eigenvalues are less than zero. Okay, so that means that the uh, I, uh, the A matrix is uh, negative definite. Okay, so we suppose that the A matrix is negative definite and we plug in <coughs> the eigenvalue there. It's a negative number, so AJ is positive and minus AJ is negative. And we get the spectral radius and you quickly find, if you take the magnitude of the top and the magnitude of the bottom, that the spectral radius is one as long as all these eigenvalues are negative. Okay. On the other hand, for sufficiently small time steps, an easy calculation shows that this is bigger than 1 if any of the eigenvalues of A are positive. Okay. So we do have some stability for uh, negative, uh, A negative definite. We have instability for A positive definite. Well, what, what is going on here? Can we say something and link it to, again, the softening of bonds? Can we link it to softening of bonds? And it turns out that uh, A, and I'll go back here and just show you again A. A is related to <laughs> the second derivative here. And so when the second derivative here is positive, that is when the bonds are stable, that is, is when we have a preponderance of bonds uh, for strains, in this over here, where it's stable, then uh, Ws, <coughs> Ws here is positive, and A is negative definite. Okay, so we see that we have stability of backward Euler when the preponderance of bonds, not every bond has to be uh, in the stable zone, but, but their integrated uh, sum, okay, has to conspire such that A be negative definite, okay? So if that stability, uh, the eigenvalues of that stability ma matrix A 
corresponds, negative definite corresponds to this thing being stable, okay? <laughs> or the preponderance of bonds being stable. And so that's what, what is said here, that when, when the pr this is positive, the uh, uh, th this is positive when we're stable, this is negative when we're not stable, and in summary then, there's a, a constant depending only on T, <coughs> such that if our time step is less than epsilon squared, we have local stability for backward Euler at points for which A is negative, definite. Um, and the points for which A is negative correspond to points where the preponderance of bonds are not losing, losing stiffness. Since it's an integral, we could have some, but the preponderance, according to the integrated value of A, uh, that has to be negative, definite. Okay, so that's... Anal an analysis of this nonlinear model, uh, and we it, it all seems reasonable. Um, it's a little more unstable than we we'd like, but but it is what it is. Okay, it is what it is. So um, now, what I'd like to do, sort of uh, in closing, is say, well, okay, fine. You you have some numerical analysis. You have some stability. Um, <coughs> provided that the solutions are Holder continuous, but what 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 is this Holder continuous solution doing? Uh, the originally we wrote a, some theory for L2 solutions. Now we're looking at Holder continuous solutions. Can we still get <coughs> bond breaking and a sharp interface in the limit? Okay. Okay. So so let's just push push that and and, and find out. So we have our Holder continuous solution here. Okay, and now we have existence of solution. So the next thing we'll do is we assume that we are, are given initial datum such that uh, the supremum of the paradynamic energies are less than infinity, which we can do <coughs> from last lecture. We can always show that using Grunwald inequality. Okay, and, and if we have bounded initial data, then we know that for every epsilon, our, our Holder continuous solutions, the paradynamic energies of these are less than infinity, okay? It's the same analysis as I did last, last lecture, and that the supremum of the velocities, so this is the initial data, okay? Not, not, the, not the, the, but this is just saying that, that this is bounded. So before, remember I said that the initial data was, in, uh, was linear elastic, had bounded energy in linear elastic fracture mechanics, which meant that it had bounded linear elastic um, paradynamic, or it had bounded paradynamic energy, and then the initial velocities like so. The new uh, thing, which we did before, was as we assumed a uniform L infinity bound on the, on the uh, family, okay? And that's typical in image processing. Again, uh, this can be, you know, one can try to remove that using notions of generalized special uh, functions of bounded variation uh, introduced by Del Mezzo. <coughs> um, but this is, we asked, so this is the whole, this is, so we'll prepare our initial data such that the paradynamics energies of the initial deformation are bounded for all epsilon. So now I'm taking epsilon dependent initial data. Whereas before I took initial data that was in SBV, it was given, we had an initial crack set. Now I'm saying, hey, we got Holder continuous initial data. I'm going to choose a family of Holder continuous initial data. Okay, that's the difference between this lecture and last lecture. <coughs> but as before, I assume everybody's uniformly bounded in L infinity of the solutions. That is the only assumption we make. Uh, then, again, there is at least one cluster point of this sequence belonging to L infinity, L, L0, two, okay, as before. And the reason is, is because Holder continuous Functions are L2 functions, okay? So we can use the machinery of before, and, and so we can ex show existence of a cluster point in L2. And then using the machinery of before, we can show that that limit point is uh, automatically a function of uh, bounded deformation, special function of bounded deformation. And it has bounded fracture energy, okay? So this is true, again, with the Holder continuous guys. Um, and in particular, you know, for mild, say, Holder continuous initial data, we can probably check that off. 
Okay? But if we have a sequence of holder continuous data going to uh, something in SB, or in s approaching uh, uh, a fracture like uh, SBD uh, data, then, uh, and that's a nice open problem, it just hasn't been done yet, but it maybe already is done. I don't know, I have to ask the experts. Um, that, um, then you will have a participation of this part as well. So the point is, is that we can look at a sort of a regularized formulation of uh, holder continuous functions and, and solve our dynamics and pass in the limit again to a sharp interface limit provided our initial data as epsilon goes to zero becomes sufficiently wild. <coughs> so I, I can, uh, uh, understanding, you know, how the initial data is, uh, can be embedded into the um, class of SBD, there's a, you know, an old theorem of roger Tamam, which says that <coughs> some strict approximation of SBD functions in terms of uh, smooth initial data and you can, it's not dense in the SBV norm, but it's SBD norm, but it's, there's a way to approximate it and that needs to be pursued. <coughs> um, <coughs> as before, the constants are given, as I, I had shown you in last lecture, the same constants, and again, it, should we have a, a fracture, the deformation crack set pair records the brittle fracture evolution in the limit. And again, away in the quiescent zone, away from uh, where, where we have softening, we just suppose that for all uh, points, there, there exists a D prime, such that for all points in D prime, the strain is below softening. And if that's true for all epsilon, then we know that the limit point here, the cluster point, evolves elastodynamically on this subdomain, the quiescent subdomain and in terms of, and is, is mediated the evolution there, we don't have a crack, but we still have the wave equation on this quiescent subdomain. And again, the stress is given by the, the Lemay moduli and then and shear moduli. This is the volume changing part, this is shape changing part, and these are given by the usual formulas. <coughs> um, and again, the weak notions of derivatives are, are invoked here. So, <coughs> that's this model. This is kind of a rundown for you. Now, <coughs> what's missing? Well, like I said earlier in the uh, first lecture, was is that we don't have damage here. That is, if we're really pulling, then inertia continues and things begin continue to yield. But if we have a cyclic loading, which is very important, planes go up, planes go down, parts uh, land, you know, planes land, parts get jarred. There's a cycle to the loading. So. <coughs> we really would like to accumulate damage each load cycle. Okay, so there in this model there's no damage. Okay, um, that's okay, you know, like I said there, uh, as if there's large inertia, uh, but as it states, since it can heal, the model essentially is pure elastic. I mean, you got, you know, it, it goes smooth, but it could always come back. Okay, that's, that's what I'm saying. <coughs> the dynamics will probably keep it breaking is you're, you're not going to see it heal but <coughs> but in principle y if you have cyclic loading you better want to damage it a little bit and then damage it some more if you load even harder okay you, you need something like that some sort of damage involved and so <coughs> there is a damage model recently that shows uh, existence of solution uh, for irrevocable irrevocable I, I'm not saying that incorrectly, bond softening. So once a bond goes soft, it doesn't g ever get as stiff as it used to be, <coughs> okay? And irrevocable bond softening. And this is by Etienne Emmert and Dimitri Post um, here. And then another one, well, no, in the same article they show, hey, if you start off with continuous uh, solution of your paradynamics and you even have irrevocable, irrevocable bond softening, you still remain continuous if you have continuous initial data. Okay, so if you start with just one and the same initial datum and you look and you don't send epsilon to zero, you don't break anything. Things are still continuous. That's good, actually, because <coughs> you would like a regularized cracked model and if you can damage it and it's still continuous, maybe the derivatives are going bad, um, that's, that's a good thing. So you would like to have a... a, a 
regularized or mesoscopic model where things are not breaking, but in the sharp interface limit, they do break. Okay. Uh, the other thing I remember, I uh, well, I'll, I'll go on. I'll add some more things. Um, now, the analysis that we have here with this numerical analysis agrees uh, and shows that um, basically, I didn't show this, but the modulus of continuity for these holder continuous functions actually diverges to infinity uh, as, the highs, uh, as the horizon goes to zero. Okay? And this really sort of motivates, I'm, I'm pretty much sure, ensures brittle limit behavior even without bond breaking for finite epsilon, okay? So in the limit, <coughs> you're probably going to see it given bad enough initial data or if you wait long enough and you pose your dynamics over long enough times. So everything is in agreement here, in the accord actually. <coughs> so this doesn't, this is just a dynamic model, things can start to separate. Here we involve a bond breaking, here we don't, okay? But everybody agrees. So for dynamic loading and pulling apart, this model is okay. For cyclic loading, we need a better model. Uh, this is a proposal for a model for uh, cyclic loading. <coughs> Although they don't say it in their thing, but that, that's what it could be used for. Um, what I want to mention here is some computational aspects. Um, the non-local model for fracture is formulated as a continuum model and then uh, some discretization. No relation between the discretization and the and underlying continuum model is given except for a cosmetic one, okay? So, so no, no convergence uh, of the discretization is given. You're on your own. <coughs> um, and then in engineering, uh, most models are formulated in the discrete setting only. And that makes it hard to identify the underlying continuum model. And hard to say whether it's mesh dependent or independent. So there's a host of, of misdemeanors, and hopefully they're not felonies being com committed, borrowing uh, some uh, reference to numerical crimes by famous people that you probably all know. Um, and, and so hopefully all your crimes are misdemeanors, <laughs> but uh, occasionally there could be some felonies appearing here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm far be it from me to judge, but, but uh, enter at your own risk if you just do a discretized uh, engineering model and have no idea what the continuum model is. Um, current non-local modeling often uses horizon as a convenience for computation with, again, no rationale, okay? Work of uh, Chung Du and Tan and Gunsberger, you know, worry about this sort of thing. And, 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 and uh, for the linear problems and, and uh, for P Laplacian, and um <coughs> look at, at, at discretization, the interplay between discretization for equilibrium problems, no time, but equilibrium problems, and non local horizon. And they do a careful job of showing how you discretize given a non local horizon. And it's a very nice, very nice work done here. <laughs> and then also for the paradynamics, linearized paradynamics case, uh, this sort of asymptotical compatible schemes uh, for robust discretization is, is given in the work of uh, Du and Chan. And this is a very uh, thorough and careful work. Um, so last, I'll just reiterate, um, we're uh, advocating a multi-scale method uh, for getting features of fracture evolution without passing to the sharp interface limit. Uh, the discretization link scale is scaled respect to the non-local uh, cality, the link scale of non-locality. And it's required the spatial discretization um, for a holder uh, continuous function be the h to the holder exponent divided by the square of the horizon. And uh, for backward Euler, we require this time step. <laughs> And we have stability under radi radial perturbations, uh, provided that the uh, mat that the, the th things are stable, and um, then we have this uh, sort of iterative stability. That in with each iteration, we're getting closer to the perturbation. Um, so with that, I I, I really uh, would basically like to close by saying, well. Again, this is a multi-scale problem of type A. 
in, in the sense that we have a zone where things are softening and we, we have found that epsilon is explicitly given in terms of the work necessary to break all bonds inside a neighborhood. That was given in the last lecture. We actually have a, 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 a size for epsilon and we have uh, a multiscale problem of type A that is of localization, okay? And so here we're viewing, viewing uh, a paradynamic evolution through the prism of a, a sharp fracture model and localization of, 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 not of, of, of what's going on, a, sub, sub -link, a smaller link scale epsilon. The last thing I would like to say is, is that in the models of uh, the quasi-static models uh, and, uh, of uh, introduced by Mario and, and, and um, uh, Frank Four, <coughs> they uh, allow for fractures to appear without any defects. So remember, we, we, we know from the theory of fracture, from experiment, that uh, things tend not to break at the continuum level, but there is a flaw there, a certain link scale, flaw size, at which then it creates a stress concentration and then you get a breaking. In that type of modeling, there is no link scale. In the paradynamic model, there is. We showed the instability. If you have a jump or flaw on the link scale of the horizon, then we have an instability. We can prove that, or we prove it formally. Okay? And so this model sees that link scale, the flaw size. So if you have a flaw size on a link scale larger than the non-local horizon, this model sees it, and that could precipitate or exacerbate a jump. Okay, so there is that link scale built into this problem. Okay, now if we have no flaw, we see no jump. Okay, <laughs> the holder thing remains holder continuous. Okay, and that's good. We don't want to jump. We don't want to nucleate uh, a fissure if there's no flaw. That's why, okay, so I, I advocate for this these more non-local models because they actually see flaws. I'm not saying anything. I'm just advocating for them. Okay, you take take what I say with a grain of salt. Okay, so thank you very much. <laughs> oh, and yes. Yeah. And you have to keep a track of this because any flare and any event could be forever wide and could be and this is a very complicated time scale that you get in the electrodynamics of this kind of kind of uh, Yes. With it, yes, yes. And so that's uh, that's not my problem. <laughs> no, no, I'm I can't, that's the easy answer. That's not my problem. Uh, no, but that that is uh, uh, then one has to understand how to handle this. So I guess this analysis says there really is no free lunch. I mean, it's an expensive lunch. There is an expensive lunch here. <coughs> Well, well, thank you very much. <coughs>